Good day, everyone. We are going to get started in just a minute, but I wanted to go over a few logistical items. So the session uh, is going to be recorded and will be made available on our website. For that reason, and due to the sheer number of folks in attendance, your lines have been muted. For questions or comments, we'll be using the Q&A feature within Zoom. We would definitely like to encourage you to use that. So feel free to start typing in your questions um, as they come to mind. And what we'll do is select a handful of those at the end if we have time and then provide any questions and answers from the session in the, um, in the materials that we post to our website. So with that, So welcome, my name is Terry Martin. I'm with the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation or NAPSIG. Thank you all for joining us for our fourth in our Emergency Management EM Geoforum series. This is a part of a, a virtual seminar series that we are facilitating on behalf of the Response Geospatial Office within the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And we're partnering to further a shared vision of advancing emergency management through the promulgation of best practices and the integration of innovative technology and solutions in day-to-day -day operations. So we're all very excited that you've joined us for this topic. I know we have uh, the current pandemic on our minds, so it's great to see so many dial in as we continue to ready for hurricanes um, in the midst of COVID-19. So uh, as I mentioned, this is the fourth in our series. As registrants, you will be receiving a notification when materials from today's seminar are available, as well as information on upcoming EM Geoforum dates and topics. And you can also just check back to our events page for details and any other upcoming events as well. I did want to mention that we are developing this series in tandem with FEMA's Modeling and Data Working Group. This is a group that meets monthly and everyone's welcome to join. They cover a different topic each month that we've been working to build on in subsequent months. So they had a great meeting earlier this month on the topic of hurricanes where they covered the latest in forecasting and modeling. It was really informative. Um, for those of you who might have missed that meeting, you can send a request to the email on the screen and get slides for that session. Um, and we'll be providing the links throughout the session today. Um, so you'll have them prior to the materials going out. So anything you see on the screen, um, we'll be putting them in the chat for you. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Chris Vaughn, the Geospatial Information Officer within FEMA, who really had the vision behind the series to get us kicked off both on the hurricane topic that we will be discussing today and the vision of the EM Geoforum series. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Terry, and uh, welcome, everybody. I just want to extend that welcome that Terry uh, gave you all. It's so vitally important for us to have <clears throat> this open communication with the community. And, you know, let me just start off by saying this is an evolving concept. Uh, like, like Terry said, we've only done this. This is our fourth time of doing this. We're getting better at it every time. I'm so excited uh, for what you guys are going to hear today, and it's going to be the latest and greatest that we're aware of. But that by no means is the definitive answer, right? The only way we as a community get better is by having open dialogue and communication strategies like this. So we are super interested in your feedback. What are we missing? How do we make this process better? And just to give you an example of that, like you heard Terry say, there's a lot of things that are being interwoven together. So we've got the modeling and data working group that is, uh, you know, re re reporting to the response emergency support function leaders group. And so interagency discussions and dialogues, efforts like this, all the way down to we're writing incident specific standard operating procedures, SOPs. And we're doing things like that even at a, you know, our own small little team, you know, very small handful of people. And, and it's taking us weeks to get through these SOPs. Why? Because the geospatial community is advancing so so fast and so rapidly, it's just hard to keep up. And so we'll, we'll, we'll get into a debate, you know, we're currently working on the tornado SOP. We'll get into a debate about, you know, uh, workflows. And I didn't know you were doing that. Well, I didn't know you were doing that. And that's just our small team, right? And things like COVID, when you've got the entire nation coming together on big geospatial coordination calls, I didn't know Missouri was doing that. I didn't know Kentucky was doing that. So, you know, wonderful advancements that everybody's making. And so that that's our contribution of trying to figure out what you guys are doing and how you're advancing community. We want to learn from you 
and capture those best practices. So that's what we're going to talk a lot about today. Some of those best practices are going to be highlighted today. Um, we've got some great speakers lined up for you from our preliminary damage assessment team. You're going to hear the latest and greatest from, from how FEMA's doing PDAs. You're also going to hear a little bit about how we're thinking about crowdsourcing for high watermarks. So different ways to gather, uh, you know, on the ground readings and situ readings uh, for an incident like a flood that's, that makes the whole hurricane response uh, better. So I'm excited for what you guys are going to hear. But more importantly, we really want to get to this last bullet point of getting and, and soliciting your feedback so that we as a community can grow stronger, faster, and better. So thanks. Back over to you, Terry. It's great to have you all here with us today. Great. Thank you so much. Um, that was a really great uh, intro to what we're hoping to accomplish today. Uh, we have so much to discuss, so I, I want to introduce you to your panelists, um, and we'll be introducing you to them um, along the way. But this is who you'll be hearing from today. It's always good to have, I think, uh, a face to the voice. So we're going to start off with me. I'm doing just a kind of a brief introduction and then passing it over to my colleague, Paul Doherty, and then some, some great folks at FEMA and to share some of the work they're doing and how they're collaborating with you all. So um, for all of you who may be new to NAPSIG, I really just wanted to have a very brief introduction of, of who we are. Um, so we're a 501c3 nonprofit uh, organization established in 2005. Uh, we have a member network of over 20,000 uh, geospatial technologists, practitioners, public safety leaders all across the nation. And we're comprised of a board of directors uh, of many of the uh, groups that you see here. Um, and part of our vision is really to uh, work with you all to equip the community with the tools and the resources you need uh, to advance the emergency management community. And so how do we do that? We do that through a series of um, activities, including publishing national guidelines and standards and exercises and simulations and education and training and outreach, just like uh, the seminar we have today. And then often doing uh, a lot of tech, tech assistance and transferring that knowledge to uh, the community. So who do we have participating today? So we had uh, a little over 200 folks, I believe, registered of that. We were able to map 195 of those. So we have a really good um, cross section of, of the US, which is great. Um, it looks like we have a really good showing of both local and federal partners. And most of you seem to identify with emergency management, search and rescue, fire service. And we have a, a large uh, cadre of others, so that'd be kind of interesting to delve into. Um, but we have uh, quite a good group, a cross section from all sectors, which is always really exciting. So what are the objectives today? So I don't want to read these word for word, but what are we hoping that you'll get out of today? Um, well, we're hoping to leave with a better understanding of the preliminary damage assessment process, the points of coordination between states, regions, and FEMA headquarters, as well as the latest tools to aid your jurisdiction in collecting and reporting damage assessments. We also hope you'll leave with insight into how FEMA regions work with their state partners in preparation for and during a hurricane to include efforts like collecting high water marks that can improve flood modeling and forecasting, but also support obtaining a disaster declaration. So first on our agenda, uh, we're going to hear from my colleague, Paul Doherty, who has been developing this concept of the geospatial game plan to ready you and your organization for not just hurricanes, but across all disasters. So I want to turn it over to Paul in just a second. He's our Director of Technology Innovation for NAPSIG, and among many other things, he's been a biologist, law enforcement search and rescue ranger at Yosemite National Park, an adjunct instructor for the Johns Hopkins University Advanced Academic Program, where he taught GIS for emergency management. And with NAPSIG, he currently focuses on ensuring that the entire public safety community has access to the geospatial training and resources needed for their day-to-day -day operations and beyond. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Paul. All right, I'll just take control of the screen here. Let me know when my audio and screen are coming through. Looks great. Okay, great. All right, well, I'm not sure how many people are here from our last um, gathering. We were talking about tornadoes. But I've got a really similar message today, maybe with a, a hurricane flavor, and it should give some context for the rest of the speakers. So the topic that I want to discuss is just 
the topic of uh, geospatial game plans. And when we talk about game plans, you know, it really depends on what uh, type of agency you're working in, but in particular in local government, we find that forming your team is often the, the first and trickiest part is who are my stakeholders if I'm a GIS specialist and I'm trying to pull together a team of stakeholders to gather needs or vice versa, you might be like a public information officer and you may not know all the different uh, players that uh, go into producing something like a public information map. And so forming the team is the first step. And I acknowledge during COVID-19, it's harder than ever to do this in a face-to-face -face way. When we talk about um, once you've formed your team, we need to identify the core information needs. And these are uh, a term that's used a lot. Sometimes we say essential elements of information, but really what we're talking about is what is the information that we know we're gonna need to help decision makers make decisions in advance? In other words, on disasters, there's always a surprise need, but what are the ones that we know we're gonna need to satisfy in advance? And so I'm just gonna talk about some examples for hurricanes today. Um, there's no way to make an exhaustive list, but I just wanted to highlight some of the key things you might consider in a, in a geospatial game plan. So hurricanes, right? First thing is we're all used to seeing these graphics and this one is traumatizing because it was Hurricane Michael. I think we were coming off of a long weekend and a tropical, uh, you know, an area of tropical concern quickly became a major hurricane and uh, hit the Florida coast very hard. Well, you know, these are graphics that often get shared through email, through Twitter and other things. And uh, one of the things we find really important is in addition to these graphics, you can actually pull the layers of uh, tropical storm uh, and tropical uh, weather warning forecasts into your existing maps and apps. And this way it's sort of a dial tone service and always there. And I know that both NOAA and the Esri Living Atlas host these services and you can bring them into your own uh, your own maps so you're not always flipping through different websites. But that's obviously the bread and butter of like how we get in touch with in, uh, you know, an upcoming hurricane. And it's something that serves as a common operating uh, picture as we go into potential impacts. But something you may not have known is that around the country and in particular at the, at the, the FEMA GIS team is while we're figuring out where the hurricane's gonna go, there are uh, analysts that are putting together analysis about where do we expect to see the biggest impacts. And so this is one of probably several examples, but it's called POST, Prioritizing Operations Support Tool. And there's a long story behind this that the FEMA team can share with you, but this is a layer that uh, in particular for Hurricane Michael, they were sharing in advance. It looked at wind, storm, uh, uh, storm surge and flood water and over overlapped it with uh, impact areas. In other words, like where are there key values that these hazards might intersect with? And this, this could have served a very uh, useful tool for organizations like search and rescue teams who are trying to prioritize where to put their resources. You might want to put them as close to this purple area, but not quite within it uh, when you're staging for the disaster. So that's just an example. But, you know, uh, hurricanes are very complex. There's a lot of information to consider. And if you've attended any of our recent NAPSIG webinars, you'll understand that I think starting with what does the public need to know uh, is a really good place to start. And so three key questions that always come up is, am I safe here? Where can I go for safety? And how can I get there? So if the public has those questions, that means you have to have a game plan to uh, support the public in making those decisions. And there's two resources here. There's a, a webinar we did focused particularly on the GIS specialist for public information maps. And there's one here for the actual PIOs. And I suggest you watch those videos as a team and uh, begin to think about your game plan. So to simplify that, you know, what are we talking about in terms of hurricanes is most states have pre-existing hurricane um, evacuation zones, and then they trigger those based on the forecasted impacts. And I know Florida State did a great job with the Know Your Zone program, but keeping track of which areas have actually been evacuated is one of the more difficult uh, things that comes up during a hurricane, but is really key to have a regional picture of. So that's going from what, knowing your zone to, you know, which zones are actually uh, evacuated. Then we go to the, where can I go for safety question? And uh, this is not Hurricane Michael, I didn't have data for that, but this is a, a GIF from uh, Hurricane Florence. And you know, what we're showing here is what's the status of shelters? Shelters are managed locally, but we really need to have a regional picture uh, to understand 
where people can go, uh, especially uh, to get out of the impact area. This is just an example of the status of shelters changing as Florence uh, gets closer to the coast and um, eventually uh, hits the Carolinas. Um, finally, you know, there is a national shelter system and that is a rest service you can add to your map. I know the national shelter system is getting a revamp, but also consider partnering with VOADs. Uh, in this example is Cedar Digital Core who are helping to crowdsource the status of shelters when traditional systems uh, have a hard time keeping up. I think that'll be in particular important this year with uh, non-congregate sheltering due to COVID-19. And then finally, if we know, um, if we can inform the public of where they are and are not safe, we can inform them of where they can go for safety or uh, shelter. They really still need to know how do they get there. And so evacuation routes are something that are determined generally in advance. But what's much harder to keep track of is road status. And so uh, a lot of state DOTs have a feed for their highways, but then what do local agencies do for their local roads um, and, and being able to assess the status, not just of closures, but of traffic and bottlenecks. And I know the Ways Connected Citizens Program is one way that agencies have been able to tap into that resource to complement their authoritative transportation status data. And all the links will be available through the story map. So those are some examples in particular that are important to the public. Um, as Chris mentioned, we can also tap into the public and ask for their help. Uh, many people turn to social media to share their photos online. And here, uh, Napsig Foundation partners with the GIS Corps to actually map the photos, because as many of you know, these photos are not always geo-referenced or geo-tagged when they're on social media. And so we work with a large volunteer team to get these photos onto a map. And those are a great way to understand early reports of damage from the public before we even have uh, things like damage assessment in play. Uh, for hurricanes, it's especially important to think about your remote sensing game plan. Uh, here was a surprise uh, from a team called Crasar, where they flew drone imagery uh, in uh, the impact zone of Hurricane Michael, and they provided seamless, seamless author mosaics on top of all the other uh, remote sensing data and they even provided these great uh, 360 views, which were extremely useful for search and rescue teams, just getting an understanding of the impacts before they, uh, before they even arrive on scene. So, you know, thinking outside the box about remote sensing, but the good news is FEMA has a remote sensing uh, coordination group, and you can tap into that to make sure that you're not missing any data sources. You know, uh, something that's near and dear to my heart and we've been working very closely with is, you know, geo-enabling search and rescue teams. They play a large role in uh, the, not only life safety, but assessing the initial impacts. And while they're not typically trained in a full uh, financial assessment, they're very good at quickly assessing the structural safety of a building um, and taking a photo of it that could be used to inform further stages in the damage assessment. And in particular for a large disaster, you might be able to work with this and get, work towards your federal declaration more quickly, which is, uh, as we all know, time is of the essence when you're looking to move into recovery. So while search and rescue teams can be geo-enabled with tools like Survey123 and Quick Capture, you really need to have a game plan to, uh, to execute on this, and we provided tools here to help you get started. And then finally, uh, what you're going to hear a lot more about today from the experts is, you know, what is the actual preliminary damage assessment look like? And how do any of your earlier assessments like crowdsource photos or search and rescue uh, initial damage assessments, how does that feed into your PDA? And we shouldn't be figuring that out during the hurricane. We should have a game plan going into hurricane season. And it uh, looks like we've got a, a narrow window of time here if you haven't done this already. So I'll leave this conversation to the experts, but do know that there's a new PDA guide uh, available. And why are we talking about game plans? Um, you know, the damage assessment process alone has many, many key uh, players, but many, many people knocking on doors. And if we don't reduce the duplication of effort and reduce the complexity in this process, we're really doing the public a disservice and we're wasting time and money. Uh, time where people can get back into their homes and also time where they can understand what's happened to, uh, to their home and what to do about it next. And so we are all about streamlining this process and it does really start with first responders on the ground. So those are just some considerations for your geospatial game plan. I know com uh, how complex hurricanes are. I didn't even get into the topics of like high water marks or debris removal, 
or power outages, but you know, having a game plan, having something you can put up on a whiteboard or in a PowerPoint with your team now can go a really long way during disaster. Uh, we do provide a game plan template. It's just a Microsoft PowerPoint template that you can download from this site uh, to give you a starting point, something to have a conversation around. We put some resources here for GIS specialists. If you want to look at some of those publicly available core information needs, you can check this ArcGIS online group. For first responders, we've linked out to the search and rescue, uh, our sandbox, where you can test out some of these tools and find out how to get your team up and running. And for emergency managers, don't forget that there are already uh, ready to use tools that I think you might hear a little bit more about today, but here I just linked to the uh, Hurricane Incident Journal, which is the way FEMA kind of keeps a common operating picture going into the hurricane. And so more on that later, but this is just a story map. It's meant to maybe be a conversation piece you could take into your EOC. Uh, we will share out the link and really, really open to feedback. I'd love to know how we can help uh, with your game plan and if you have a game plan, please do share it with us so we can uh, help promulgate best practices with the community. So I think that's it for me and I'm going to uh, stop sharing, pass it back to Terry. And uh, thanks a lot for your time. Awesome, thank you so much, Paul. Um, we've received a lot of good feedback on how you've tried to frame writing this around a game plan and some of the resources that you mentioned can be really valuable and folks here may want to have them on hand and incorporate them into their products and workflows. And uh, your conversation was a really good segue to our next speakers who um, are gonna kind of speak in more detail on some of the things that you mentioned. So the two we have coming up, uh, Jarrett McLean, first is the product owner for FEMA's um, survey one, two, three PDA tool and balances feedback from PDA tool users with policy changes and leadership priorities to identify improvements to the PDA surveys. He works on the recovery operations team in the FEMA recovery directorate front office. And Jarrett has been with FEMA for about nine months before coming to FEMA. He spent six years working at the state and local levels of emergency management in Pennsylvania and Texas. In co-presenting with Jarrett, uh, we have Katie Picchioni who in her position in FEMA's response to a spatial office supports the operational use of crowdsourced and remotely sensed data. During activations of the National Response Coordination Center, her team collaborates with external volunteer groups to make crowdsource information useful to the emergency management community. And under Blue Skies, Katie works with programs across the agency to find opportunities for using remotely sensed data and aerial imagery. And she also leads FEMA's response um, Remote Sensing Innovation Working Group. Uh, it's a collaboration among federal partners and national laboratories that work to make remote sensing innovations useful for and available to emergency managers. And I think uh, Paul actually also alluded to that previously. So with that, I will turn it over to Jarrett to take control. All right, thank you. Terry, I think I have control now. Let's, if I can click through. All right, so here's a look at some of the things we're gonna go through. Um, glad to be here and, and talk about some of this stuff with you all. I will give a quick overview of the, the doctrine and guidance that you know, mentioned the new PDA manual is out, uh, how we are working with PDAs in this pandemic environment, uh, and a quick overview of the process to start. And then uh, Katie's got some demos she'll do of some tools that are out there that are helping us with virtual PDAs, and I'll do a little walkthrough of our survey one, two, three surveys for both individual assistance and public assistance and how that ties into the field assessment collection tools system, the FACT system that we use on the back end. So I'll advance to the next slide here, but just a quick overview for, for anybody who's not familiar. Uh, FEMA conducts preliminary damage assessments at the request of a state territory or tribal government that has experienced an incident of a severity and magnitude that exceeds their available resources needed to recover. Uh, a team of personnel from the state territory or tribes FEMA region will deploy to the area uh, that's affected to survey the damage. And they occur, these PDAs occur for both individual assistance, generally residences and the public assistance for infrastructure like roads and bridges, parks, utilities, publicly owned buildings, et cetera. A uh, PDA coordinator typically works from a central location, which could either be the FEMA regional office or the state EOC office or local office, and monitors this data that's coming in to track the progress of the PDA. And, and Survey123 is one new tool in the last two to three years that we've been working to make available to regions to monitor this data more in real time than, than in the past with paper and pencil. 
So this new uh, update to the PDA manual that came out recently, uh, this supersedes the previous one from 2016 and has become effective for joint PDAs that are occurring after June 8th of this year. It was released on May 8th and uh, took effect on June 8th. It's in an operational capability, which means it is still open for public comment for one year. So you can make uh, comments on this document until June 8th, 2021. Uh, but it did go into effect about three weeks ago, and that's, this is the, the version that we're using now. Uh, it's organized in a way that makes the whole process more operational and places some emphasis on the importance of initial damage assessments conducted at the uh, local and state territory, tri territorial and tribal levels. A PDA pocket guide was developed in conjunction with this manual update. Uh, that's for use in the field. It's a more condensed version similar to other pocket guides you may be familiar with, and now we have one for the, the PDA process. There's also a tribal specific annex that was developed for 2020. Uh, that's an appendix to this or an annex to this, uh, this 2020 update. Some changes to some damage definitions for individual assistance uh, were, were assigned also, including the addition of some new qualifying damages such as water flood lines reaching the roof line of a building or of a, a home or residence and a compromised roof frame, which now qualify as destroyed and they were not, um, they were not in the definitions in the previous manual. On the public assistance side, soft costs were eliminated from the damage estimates. This is to encourage more timely and accurate assessments that focus on costs that restore a facility to its previous state. And there were all, they also include things like administrative and management costs, mitigation costs, and engineering architectural uh, costs. So those are no longer included for the public assistance side with the 2020 update. And uh, on the PA side, they also introduced some desk, the opportunity to uh, conduct desktop assessments. This is acknowledging that PA PDA teams do not necessarily need to be in person to validate the damage, where FEMA can validate potential projects remotely with comprehensive initial damage assessment data. Uh, this includes thorough information and data that's provided by the local government up to the state or from the state territorial tribal governments, including photographs that dem uh, demonstrate the impact and eligibility. So some changes uh, along the way, but not as many for the PA side as for the IA side. Talking about, you know, this, the last few months here in a virtual environment due to the pandemic, uh, we have been integrating remote methods of assessment into the PDA operations for this 2020 disaster season. These remote methods will reduce or eliminate the time our assessors must spend in the field, and they are going to be implemented in coordination with the impacted jurisdictions. So our, our regional folks who are going out there to do these PDAs will work in conjunction with the affected uh, locales and the affected states, territories, or tribes to make sure that uh, everybody's on the same page as to which methods are going to be used uh, and how exactly they're going to, to go about surveying this damage and validating the damage. Uh, meetings during this time between FEMA and the impacted jurisdictions will likely occur via teleconference or video conference to avoid that necessary or the necessity of meeting face to face. Several factors will influence the degree to which we can use these methods of assessment based on the disaster. So, you know, in short, it's going to depend on things such as the type of incident and the severity and extensivity of the damage caused by that incident. And we released some guidance to our regions back on June 11th that outlines some tools that are available to help them conduct these PDAs remotely or in like a virtual manner. Uh, and some of those tools uh, we'll, we'll talk about here today. They can analyze initial damage assessment data and photos, like I said, for uh, PA, we're making that a standard process. Uh, it's going to be up to the region and it's going to depend on, on how, how thorough that data is, whether they can do it completely remotely or not. But that's one method, along with uh, incorporating aerial imagery of the damage, predictive modeling tools, and uh, some GIS data sets like building footprints or local tax data that could come into, uh, come into play to provide identifying information on owner renter status uh, for individual assistance national flood insurance program information for whether or not those homes were insured in a flood type event, uh, that sort of thing. And as I said, uh, Katie will walk through some of those tools that are available to our regions here in a little bit. 
If after using these methods, certain damages remain undetermined and FEMA can't complete the assessments remotely, these assessors may have to go into the field to verify in person, depending on the, the public health situation in the affected area. If they do deploy, uh, we'll use as few personnel as possible to make sure that uh, social distancing occurs and may rely on windshield assessments to complete the PDA in a, prior, uh, a timely manner. And now I will toss it over to Katie and give up the, the remote control here and toss it over to Katie to talk about some of these geospatial tools. And I'll be back in a minute to talk about the Survey123 surveys. Awesome, thanks very much, Jarrett. Um, well, I'm super excited to, to be here today. And um, you know, what, from the Response Geospatial Office perspective, one of the things that we wanna emphasize is the, that we make a lot of geospatial tools and geospatial data available to the whole community for use in, in preliminary damage assessments and uh, you know, to all of, the, all of the applications that Paul was talking about before. Um, so th three of the applications that we really wanted to, to speak to or like the, the needs for preliminary damage assessments are you know, how do you plan field operations? How can you use geospatial tools to gain situational awareness before sending out field crews or in lieu of sending out field crews? Um, similarly, how can geospatial tools assist with collecting data for preliminary damage assessments? And then, um, and then finally, how can imagery and other remote sensing and other geospatial tools help with virtually assessing and validating damage assessments? Um, so if we have, we selected a few tools to highlight here. Oops. Um, and I just wanted to, to do a couple live demos. So all of these resources that I'm going to show are available through the, the GeoPlatform community, disasters.geoplatform.gov, um, and are also available on our new Geospatial Hub, which is uh, up and coming. We had a soft launch of it a couple weeks ago, and we're continuing to build that. We'll be continuing to build that out over the next, the, the next few weeks and months. Um, so, you know, a couple of the tools that I think are really helpful for planning and preparing for preliminary damage assessments um, and for executing preliminary damage assessments. Uh, one of them is the hurricane or the, well, we have a series of incident journals for, um, you know, all the different types of incidents uh, and the hurricane incident journal in particular is one of them. Um, again, this is available on our website and uh, you can go in and you can change the different data layers you see. The incident journals really are repositories of all of the authoritative data um, from different government agencies and on the event itself. So when there's actually a hurricane coming, you'll see you'll see the the hurricane tracks. Um, you'll see other you know uh, projected storm surge models and other authoritative models um, and data from the agencies that curate those resources. One of the other tools I wanted to show off is the uh, prioritizing operation support tool, POST, that Paul was talking about before. Um, POST is, a, is a, an app, or it's a tool that you can run in Arc Pro, um, or I think Arc, uh, Arc Map as well. And uh, you can publish the results right to a web map, but uh, it's, you know, it's exactly this. It shows sort of the areas that are projected to be heavily impacted based on the event data and the uh, the, the social vulnerability data, population, that sort of thing. Um, so where are there likely to be heaviest impacts based on the people who are living there and the projected course of the event? Um, I also want to, at this point, give a shout out to the HAZIS team. Um, you know, the HAZIS is, an, is another modeling tool that is you know, open and available from FEMA. It requires a little bit more uh, technical, you know, specific expertise to use but um, that tool is also available for, you know, understanding where impacts will be heaviest and how that might affect PDA operations. Um, so a modeled product like this, you could look to get, you could look at to get a sense of where should we be looking for damage? Um, if we are sending out field crews, where, you know, where are the priority areas for them to go? Um, also, what areas might, might be too heavily impacted to go into um, or what areas might still be flooded? The last product I wanted to show off, oh, hopefully, yeah, hopefully it'll load. Um, this is a, a flood product you, that uses data from the VIRS satellite and VIRS sensors. Um, and so this is uh, generated, uh, it's, a, it's a NOAA satellite, and this product um, is a joint, it's both official data 
and also a product that our team in RGO has put together. Um, so it shows the, the pink is a five day average of where there has been more water than usual. And um, on, oops, on the other layer here, uh, and there's a slider, it normally shows where uh, a daily update of where flooding is current. So right now there's actually not very much in this area, um, but this is like a live product for situational awareness. So th those are just a couple of the resources that we have. Um, this is the, this is our current hub site. So you can click around um, and you know, there are, there's a lot, there are a lot of resources here. Uh, we're continuing to build out, making them easy to find. And then uh, there's also the disasters geo platform site where uh, there are a lot of data layers. You can easily get to the incident journals here. Um, so those are just a few of the resources that are available to the community. And uh, at this point, I will turn it back, or uh, yeah, I'll turn, the, turn it back over to Jarrett to talk about the Survey123 tool that FEMA makes available um, you know, to support the collection of data in the field. PDS. Thanks, Katie. And if you don't mind clicking through this couple slides, then I'll do a uh, my screen share and demo the tool for everybody. Um, as I said, our tool is about three years old. We're on to our third version of the tool. Uh, version 303 is our current version. Uh, and we've kind of had these goals all along. Um, I had the luxury of starting and overlapping about six weeks with my pre uh, predecessor when I started in this position. So I, I kind of got the good history background of the, the intent of this tool and, and how they've gotten to the point they've gotten to now. So for sure, efficiency and accuracy are two of the cornerstone goals that we have. We want a tool that's going to be efficient so that our folks will want to use it in the field. Um, you know, everybody's used to using a pen and paper. Uh, it's, a lot, it's a lot more advantageous to, on, the, on the backside to our PDA coordinators if they can see the data coming in live and on a map so they can get a better common operating picture that way. And we want it to be accurate. So we want to make sure there's enough training in place that the user knows how to use the tool in the most efficient manner and that they get the right information in there. So that way all the information that's showing up on the backside is correct uh, and it, it, it will influence decision making as to how the, the PDA operation is going. Other, other uh, goals that we have, we want to make it you know, user friendly, kind of goes hand in hand with the efficiency. Uh, and streamline of information sharing. This is a big one right now because of the virtual environment that we're in uh, during the pandemic. Uh, more information that we can share, the better, because we're all working remotely, or at least to the maximum extent possible in the terms of PDAs. However, uh, we run into some roadblocks because our tool itself is behind a firewall. So there's certain information that we just can't share into our system, especially if it's external to FEMA, external to the agency. So that's, that's something that we're working on and focusing on a lot right now are ways that we can share our information out and also share other sources of information in so that way it's more of a one-stop shop and they don't have to, the user doesn't have to use a whole bunch of tools uh, and they can, they can minimize the number of windows that they have to have open and they can pull more data into one system. And increasing state capacity is always a big one. Um, we do make our tools uh, or surveys uh, publicly available. So that way, and, and you know, it's not even really just state, it's all of our partners, you know, uh, local jurisdictions, uh, local jurisdictions, tribes, territories, states, everybody can, can use our survey templates if they want a place to start and don't want to have to reinvent the wheel. And they're welcome to uh, make their own tweaks to those surveys, add questions that maybe FEMA doesn't ask, but as a state, they might want to know or remove questions that aren't pertinent to them. But at least two, if they have a place to start, um, then, then that can mesh well with the region that's out there using Survey123 to collect this information. All right, next slide. Okay, this is an overview of the FACT system and how it works, kind of like a, a 35,000 foot map. So we have the FACT system at the top. Uh, I, will, I will note that the Disaster Survivor Assistance Program also runs on the FACT system. So this isn't just a PDA system, but uh, Recovery uses this for for multiple different programs. So preliminary damage assessments is sort of that first step. And then we have our, a similar set of surveys and another product owner and everything for the, the uh, DSA side also. So we have the survey one, two, three form on the phone. That information that's collected gets populated into the, the system on the back end, goes up into the cloud and uh, the PDA coordinator can look at those, the, or look at that information in our points viewer 
or on the dashboard to see those counts coming in. For IA, we're working on an adjustment for PA so that they can see dollar figures come in for each uh, category of damage for public assistance. And then on the back side, we have a reporting application that'll run all the algorithms necessary to generate the dollar figures that uh, will be needed for the, the report that needs to be sent up to uh, the declarations unit in, uh, in recovery. So it's, it's kind of like start to finish throughout the whole PDA process. There's tools uh, that go into this. And like I always tell folks when I'm giving training for survey one, two, three, the, the better the information is when it goes in, the better the, the process will be on the backside. We'll get more accurate information real quick on the reporting application. You won't have to go into Excel anymore and, and do uh, a manual data entry to get the correct uh, dollar figures. So before I show the link for um, the surveys, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, I think. Hold on a second. Oh, okay. okay, Katie, I'll need you to drop, or somebody I'll need to drop, whoever's sharing. Is that, uh, is that you, Katie? No, that's, there we go. Okay, I should be good now. Share. All right, so I'll just walk through, in the interest of time, I'll walk through one of the surveys and just kind of show how it's laid out. Uh, this is the individual assistance main survey. We actually have a second individual assistance survey. It is uh, an express version that allows us to uh, look at multiple homes in one survey. So we can tally multiple homes if it's in an area like a subdivision or a mobile home park. We can also choose to do a, an entire street or block in the same manner. Uh, and that will, if there's, there's a mobile home park with say 60 mobile homes, we can survey all of them at once without having to do 60 individual surveys. But these surveys were built off of the street sheets that we used and still continue to use in some regions. And in some cases they do those in conjunction with survey one, two, three. Uh, all of these questions came off of the street sheets. Uh, it takes the user's coordinates and it plots the point there. They also have the option to go in and edit this and move that around. Uh, depending on if, if they load this survey up, it's gonna take their location then. So if they move in the meantime uh, and wanna recenter it, they can, they can do that. Uh, all of the spatial information, such as the street address, the city town, all that information goes in here. And then I can also set uh, parameters in the background, such as what event type is involved with the incident and then the, uh, the start date and time. I can set all that so that the polling service in the background background will run through and any open point that's created in the state where we're working, it will pull that data into the, uh, into the survey and it'll automatically populate that for them. We also built in a feature that they can put immediate needs if they come across a situation where there's uh, maybe a utility outage that's been prolonged and, and some folks either need some fresh food or they're, you know, it's the middle of winter and the heat's not working, that sort of thing. They can flag that for the PDA coordinator and it'll show up on our dashboard. And then we get down to the part where they can assess their damage level in coordination with the, the other folks who are on the joint PDA team. They can also put in information here like insurance, owner renter status, primary resident status, all of this goes into the calculations that are on the back end. And while these are required, we also put a, an unknown in case the, the field user doesn't know the answer to this question, it gives them an out so that they're not stuck putting in an answer and, and having to guess. But again, all these are built in from the, uh, the street sheet. And at the end, they have an additional narrative section where they can put any other information they want and then provide up to three photos for individual assistance. We're working on an increase on photos for public assistance. So that's a look at, at the individual assistance. We have training surveys also, clones of all three, public uh, assistance, individual assistance, and IA Express. We have clones of those so that they can go in and, and work in like a sandbox format and uh, and that way they don't in interrupt with any live data that's coming in. And real quick, I just wanted to show on the back side, this is our fact system. You can go into a launch pad and there's a list of tools that are down the left-hand side. We have a points viewer that they can go in and, and if they have certain rights, they can go in and edit information that was sent in. They can filter and sort this information right within the tool or they can export to a CSV file and work with the information off of the system. This is a look at our, uh, I'm gonna select this to zoom back out. This is a look at our dashboard. The numbers have been reset because we went to a new version recently, uh, but they have the counts across the top, live counts that are coming in for each damage level. This is for individual assistance. 
Uh, and then over here is the numbers of immediate needs that are out there and the number of needs review. And then there's the, uh, the, the reporting application and I'm not signed in right now, so I won't show that one uh, in the meantime in the, the, uh, the sense of time here. But uh, for both public assistance and IHP cost projection, they can go in and get the numbers necessary to go into the reporting validation uh, report that's got to go up to the declarations unit. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. And then if we can get the slides back, uh, once they make these slides available, you can click on the link that's in the, the, next, um, the next slide that'll show, or we'll point to where we have the surveys publicly available on our website. So if you are interested in using our surveys as they're laid out, you can take a look at that link. They are at the bottom under the PDA templates section. All right. And so, I know we're, we're a little over time, but the last thing we wanted to emphasize was, you know, that there's a, there are a lot of remote sensing resources that can support preliminary damage assessments. Um, these are two examples from, uh, from recent events that where the Civil Air Patrol collected imagery to support, um, you know, support response and, and recovery operations. Um, so this is a picture from the, the Midland flooding back in May, I believe. And uh, we also wanted to quickly show off some of the, the 3D imagery that the Civil Air Patrol has been collecting. Um, this was Jonesboro, Arkansas, uh, after one of the tornadoes in, I think, the beginning of April. But um, you can zoom in, and there is an automated damage assessment model that takes a look. OK, it's, it's loading. But there's an automated damage assessment model that takes a look at the imagery and um, estimates whether the structure is has minor damage, major damage, uh, or, or is destroyed, I think affected minor major destroyed in, along the PDA scale. So, um, you know, these resources are, are available. Um, uh, the Civil Air Patrol is fairly, you know, they, they're, they're there and uh, can be uh, mission assigned from, from FEMA or from at the state and local level as well. So, um, you know, in addition to uh, other commercial providers, small and manned aerial systems, university partners, there are a lot of opportunities for imagery that's collected. Um, there's also a lot of satellite imagery out there, uh, some of which is available uh, through, you know, through our Disasters Geo platform, some of which is available on the NASA Disasters site. So um, there, yeah, there are a lot of resources to support preliminary damage assessments and feel free to reach out to either Jared or myself with any questions or any follow-ups. Thanks very much. Perfect. Thank you both so much. You had so much to cover and I know it was hard to squeeze it in a short amount of time. So thank you for, for pulling all that together. Um, I'm going to quickly go into our next presenter. You all um, kind of set the stage well for what he's going to be covering, which is, you know, this theme of how coordinating our efforts to pull in different data types can really help us understand the size and the scope of damage from an event like a hurricane and inform the declaration process. So uh, our next speaker is Alan Johnson, a civil engineer uh, at FEMA Region 6 within mitigation and their risk assessment branch. He has 34 plus years experience in the hydrologic, hydraulic and mapping aspects of floodplain mapping, both in FEMA and in the private sector. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Alan, and I'm happy to navigate your slides when you're ready. Okay, thank you. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about kind of the end product, the data collection and documentation of what actually occurred, which is what we'll be doing when we collect high water marks. This helps us uh, validate and check our flood maps, our uh, inundation maps uh, from the other agencies, and basically helps us document how this event matched up versus what we say for recurrence interval. Because uh, everybody's always interested in, oh my gosh, it was a 500 year event when in reality it was only a foot or so above the 1% event, which is on the flood maps for uh, floodplain management. Um, one of the biggest aspects is how do we collect this data and how do we do it while working in a socially distancing environment? Uh, next slide, please. I uh, really want to emphasize that we do this primarily th through um, 
our coordination within our what we call the inform group which is the four primary water collection agencies uh, in the US government which is USGS um, NOAA National Weather Service uh, the US Army Corps of Engineers and then FEMA um, this document if you take nothing else from my portion of the high water marks presentation is a I call it almost biblical uh, type publication in that it really does a great job of presenting how to collect it all the safety considerations things to look out for on coming up with the high water marks in in collection so if anybody's looking for ways that locals can start providing the high water marks themselves rather than having um, a slew of USGS employees come on out from an event during an event um, this is the starting place to go to collect that information many of the slides I'll have further down go from come from this report next slide please so how does FEMA and the USGS begin to do this um, Typically, when a hurricane is coming in shore, the Regional Response Coordination Center will open on up within the FEMA regional offices, and then the risk, risk analyst will uh, coordinate with the USGS about um, what we think will be the areas of impact, how many sites do we think we're gonna be able to afford, and start laying out the mission. Hurricanes are kind of nice in the regard that we can actually kind of pre-plan before we actually have to have troops on the ground. Um, we will then write a mission assignment. You can see on the other side, if you can read real fine print, the information that we've kind of requested, which ties in where are we going to do it, how are you going to do it, and what are you going to provide back as a report. Um, the USGS would then mobilize their resources, mainly personnel to ground collect. Um, that's going to be one of the most impacted areas in a social environment that we are currently under. Um, so they're looking for opportunities to train staff and, and volunteers to collect um, more information. There's also some activities with the Civil Air Patrol in that regards. So after you've collected and flagged the information, then a survey team comes out and actually gets the elevations in uh, the North American vertical datum of 1988 uh, then a report gets generated that gets posted at the uh, flood event site at the USGS and then we will also generate a report that looks at what was the frequency of this event at the various gauges and produce some inundation mapping associated with that next slide please Okay, next three slides look at some typical high water marks that you'll catch from an event. Um, this is the mud line example. You can see this in the trees, um, the shrubbery along a creek or, or a stream. You'll also be able to pick it off off of glass um, or in, inside buildings that flooded. Uh, likewise, uh, you're going through bridge abutments, you can typically get out and pick it out of where that high water got to um, off, of, off of that. Next slide. Seed lines are probably our most typical but extremely perishable um, marking these are the little seeds little grass seeds and and other really small seeds that will get hung up in uh, window screens just on the side of houses along trees 
and that gives you a real good idea of where the high water mark actually occurred. The only downside to them is basically one good rainfall after the event and they're gone. So it's very important to get out and get this information collected as rapidly as possible after the event has gone by. Next slide, please. And then the final one is you know, a lot of times on ground in particular, you'll manage to see debris lines of where the water, especially along water courses, um, has made it up to a particular uh, point and it'll just kind of accumulate and you measure to the outside edge. That's a, a third example. Okay, next slide, please. So what do you need to document this? Well, you got to be able to mark where the site was. You got to be able to flag it so we can go back and find it with the survey crew. And it has to be, I wouldn't say permanent, but you probably want to use at least a permanent marker, spray paint or something to that'll hold up for a couple of weeks, maybe a month before we end up getting out and actually physically measuring it. So that all needs to be done since a lot of the measurements are actually done, you know, we'll go in and request at a private property where, where the impact was. Uh, we may have to transfer that information to an outside source so that we don't have to intrude on that citizen a second time um, in, in getting that measurement um, listed on out. Next slide, please. One of the great techniques that's come on out recently and we should avail ourselves of is there are getting to be many applications that you can use with your camera phone to um, come up with geolocated information. And with that, you can document where you took the um, debris line in this particular case or how where it exists in information you know went out after a small rainstorm and this is a debris line near a sediment pond near my house um, took the picture you can see I was looking almost uh, north and the lat long in the approximate location um, elevation is also indicated and that's all part of the app that I used for this. There are many apps that would fit this category, probably the survey one, two, three fits that category, but you know this is something that any citizen may be able to have and if we can get enough volunteers uh, to use such a documentation and have done the proper uh, marking techniques, we could definitely um, be able to capture that data in in the future from that and then we'll have more documentation because we'll have more resources more personnel to to gather this on up i'm trying not to give the particular uh app that I used here because there's a multitude of them and we don't want to promote any one over another. Uh, next slide, please. Well, some of the things we do try to measure is there's going to be kind of a difference in, in the flooding. Um, storm surge uh, is that which is coming in off the ocean or the Gulf. And those can, you know, influence how far does that salt water intrusion go. And then the other one is, is a lot of times hurricanes just come in and dump a whole lot of rain on an area and we may get inundation that occurred basically because of interior drainage or ponding um, behind levees. So that gives you two different sets of, of flooding from that hurricane and we would work to measure those somewhat differently. We'll use the tran transducers um, to capture the storage 
surge depth and timing. Um, that helps us calibrate what is the height of the wave action and all that other good information that fits in with how we do uh, flood mapping. And um, it would be great for storms like um, Hurricane Michael, the example from Florida, uh, Ike back in 2008 and Katrina and Rita would be very beneficial to get the storm surge information. Um, it wasn't exactly the kind of thing and we did not really do any storm surge uh, measurements on Hurricane Harvey nor on Isaac, which was a small hurricane that came on into Louisiana and basically sat over an area between Baton Rouge and um, New Orleans for about four days and dumped like crazy. Those would not work well for um, storm surge, but were very important to capture for flood inundation. Next slide. I think I'm just about done. Where does this data end up? Well, if we've been working with the USGS to generate it, the USGS will post it at a publicly facing um, website so that anybody who wants to obtain and look at the data can get it. Here's where the data sets ended up from that effort from Harvey. And you can go look at the um, various disasters that have occurred by state, by event. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, I know we are running kind of late on time, so I'm going to go right into our next presenter and give him 30 seconds um, to, to kind of talk about uh, uh, some things that are also happening on the side with high watermarks. Um, as I want to be respectful of everyone's time, but we only have about two more slides after this to go through the, to, to wrap it up. So Adam Barker, are you still with us? Yeah, I'm here. So my slide is really just meant to stir conversation anyway. And uh, we at FEMA, especially in response, are interested in expanding our high watermark capabilities, especially immediately following a, an event to capture that perishable data that Alan mentioned. But I do want to stress that our intent is to only augment the USGS collections not replace them, certainly. Uh, examples would be to uh, go out and collect after smaller storms that per perhaps wouldn't warrant the mission assignments or fill those gaps uh, that are existing today due to COVID. Uh, moreover, we would only use them, we would probably use them for different purposes than the USGS uh, to take measurements in ungauged slackwater or backwater tributaries or upstream of the most upstream gauge to expand, improve our, to expand or improve on our flood depth grids. Uh, we have already explored this with the Civil Air Patrol following in Melda in Texas, and we've had conversations to continue, but we do acknowledge that there are challenges, um, and, they, and, and frankly, many of these are associated with training. But ultimately, we'd like to develop a centralized uh, way or repository or portal, portal perhaps to collect high watermarks that any crowdsourcing group can contribute to. Uh, this will take time, but in the end, we'd like all the help we can get. Thanks, Terry. Back to you. Sure. Thank you so much. I know that was a lot to fit in, so I appreciate it. Just, I think it's really good for everyone to have awareness that, you know, some of these things are getting uh, figured out. So thank you for that. Um, so where do we go from here, right? I think we threw a lot of information and resources at, at you. Um, it's a complex topic of hurricanes and then in, in uh, the midst of a pandemic. So I wanted to just share a few things of how to get started. So uh, your call to action can be to check out this template and see where your jurisdiction, your, your organization stands with, uh, do you have all these kind of information needs identified and where would you get them and who are your partners that you'll be working with? Um, so I encourage you to check out this uh, template and, and dig a little bit deeper to see where the gaps are and what maybe you still need to do to ready your, yourself and your, your organization. Um, in addition, so there's a lot of things that are going to kind of continue on. So this isn't a, a one and done conversation. We're just in the beginnings of hurricane season and maybe somewhere in the middle of COVID-19. Uh, but the conversation and points of coordination and collaboration of this community, of course, do not stop here. So for your awareness, here are some resources that are available to you. You can sign up for the daily geospatial coordination calls that happen during disasters. 
Um, when you sign up through this uh, Gov Delivery, you'll also get on their email list for their weekly newsletter, which can uh, has a lot of information about the things that we talked about today, but you'll get them throughout the year, which is uh, really great. In addition, here's the link to the uh, hub that was shown earlier, um, the geospatial game plan as it stands that Paul Doherty has put together. You can subscribe to um, the MDWG and get uh, their slides and participate in their monthly sessions when it's a topic that interests you. Um, and then in addition, you know, as we mentioned, a lot of the things we've talked about today uh, are, you know, getting ready for a hurricane, but in the midst of, of a pandemic. So I wanted to point out that there is a uh, pandemic operational guidance for the 2020 hurricane season that came out from FEMA that you might find really interesting, got some good resources on some considerations. Um, in addition, there is a hot wash questionnaire. We're all kind of in the midst of this right now. So uh, anyone who's responding to COVID-19, or uh, we're encouraging you to, um, from NAPSIG and ERISA and NISHTIC to participate in this questionnaire. So as we go through this pandemic um, over months or however long this takes, uh, we can start building on those le lessons learned. Um, and then if you uh, did not attend, there was a, a, a hot wash that goes along with that questionnaire and you can find the materials there. So we are at 3.05. I know we received a good number of questions in the Q&A, um, as well as uh, some in the chat. So what we'll do is, I think all but maybe one of the questions were answered in writing. What we'll do is we'll go back and review the questions and compile the answers and post those with the materials uh, when they are up and ready to go. So we don't wanna keep you uh, any longer. So thank you to our panelists and everyone who's participated today, um, who's participated in the chat and offered some questions. We really appreciate your engagement. We will let you know as soon as all the materials are ready. Uh, if you register, you'll get an email for those. So thank you all again, stay safe, and we hope to see you uh, at our next EMGO forum. Take care.